Thank you, Aaron. Um, okay, hi everybody. Um, I guess I should start off with a little background about myself. I grew up with a mother who was on Weight Watchers on and off most of my young life, and it left me with a deep and lasting lack of interest in diet topics because they seemed not to work. So I just assumed that the dietary guidelines were designed by smart people, and they must have good science behind their recommendations. Um, I used to refer to myself as Mr. Whole Wheat back before I discovered I was seriously gluten intolerant. And luckily after I got, so I was in my late 30s, uh, I was an executive at a big hedge fund in, on Wall Street, and I suddenly started getting very sick. I had what was initially thought to be a stroke when I was 38 years old. Uh, which left me unable to talk and unable to see for several hours. And a couple of years later, I got acute diverticulitis, which left me with a perforated colon and several stays in the hospital and ultimately a resected colon. And a couple of years after that, I discovered uh, Stephen Guillenet's blog, to give credit where it's due, and got very interested into the what he was saying about uh, diet. His malocclusion posts were the ones that first really convinced me that there was something to this because my dentist, God bless him, after making a lot of money off my cavities when I was a kid, when I was 18, told me to stop eating sugar and I wouldn't get any more cavities. And he was right. <laughs> Lo and behold. Um, so I was kind of primed for it and I've been reading labels for years to avoid added sugars. So, you know, all of a sudden I had a couple of new things to look for. Um, unlike, I was already on a low, super low sugar diet for decades and I still managed to get fat and sick, not as fat as some people did, but you know, the pound a year uh, thing that so many of us have gone through. Um, when I took fixing my diet seriously, the first thing I did was something that nobody else ever does, which was cut seed oils, which is the topic of my conversation today, out of my diet and I saw my 16 years of irritable bowel disease, which had left, led to the colon resection, resolve in two days. And I started to see a bunch of other health improvements. My weight fell off. Um, you know, I won't go into all that, but you know, it motivated me to learn what was going on because it went against everything I had been told. As my doctor said to me when I told him I was going on a high fat, low carb diet, he said, I'm really worried about you, Tucker. You know, this, is, this goes against all the recommendations. And I said, well, that's why I'm here, Doc. You run the tests, you tell me if I'm killing myself, but this seems to be the right thing to do. And shortly before I fired him, he told me I was gonna live to 100 years. So that was good, he came around. Um, so my talk today is um, why did we all get sick? The nutritional transition and how seed oils drove it. Um, Oh, hold on. Let me fix this setting down here. This is way too complicated for me. All right, there we go. Um, so first off, a lot of this is duplicative of lots of other excellent presentations, so I'm just going to zip through it. Um, human nutritional transitions probably start about 65 million years ago. That's the oldest primate ancestor, back when we ate leaves, fruit, and one imagines insects. That cute little fellow weighed three and a half ounces. Um, next big change, six and a half million years ago, we come down out of the trees, we start eating tubers, scavenged meat, and hunting small game. 2.6 million years ago, we start, since our teeth are poorly designed for eating meat, we start developing tools to allow us to cut meat, which makes it much more digestible. 1.8 million years ago, we start running after things and we get pretty good at endurance running. You've all heard that story. Uh, a million years ago, start uh, using fire, makes our food more nutritious for us. 600,000 years ago, we start seeing problems. That is a um, Neanderthal fossil. Uh, we start running out of meat and we start moving out of Africa, looking for more things to eat. 140,000 years ago, we start eating seafood in mass, right? Shell middens really only, really started about 140,000 years ago. Um, 50,000 years ago, they became incredibly prevalent, which corresponds with some later events. 
That little red oval up there is a person in Latin America standing on top of a hill made of seashells that people had eaten, the contents thereof. And those are found all around the world. Uh, 50,000 years ago, we also decided we would start, um, we would invent tools to make it easier to hunt animals. That little guy down in the lower left-hand corner is Rob Wolf, who is <laughs> using an atlatl to kill an elk when he was on a TV show called uh, I Caveman. Um, an atlatl is a throwing stick that's used to throw a spear. So they're very effective. That was his first, he practiced with it, obviously, but that was his first attempt to hunt with it, and he hit with the first try. Of course, uh, as Amber was mentioning, hunger can be very motivational, and he was starving at this point. Um, about 17,000 years ago, we started coming up with alternative means for f uses for food. This is a lamp from the uh, Lascaux cave in France. Uh, animal fats were used to um, light, you know, to light the cave paintings. Um, 17,000 years ago, beer, the collection of wild grains, and obviously the invention of pottery. Uh, 10,000 years ago, even less meat, we started, you know, taking on plant agriculture, obviously motivated by our experience with beer. And then 9,000 years ago, more meat, we invent pastoral agriculture, which is if you can't catch meat, raise your own, right? Pretty smart. Um, so the first part is basically human evolution up to humans. The second part is running out of meat, which we had then become dependent on. That is a cave painting from the Lesco cave in France, probably lit by that little lamp when they were painting it. And as everybody likes to joke in this community, they weren't hunting broccoli. <laughs> then, unfortunately, came a reliance on less uh, beneficial foods. This is actually the first incident of uh, cavities in the Paleolithic period from some folks who were eating a lot of acorns, which are very sticky starch, and snails. So don't do that. Um, as you can see, they didn't do all that well. This is from a cave in Morocco. Um, so let's get on to the interesting stuff now that we've established a little bit of a baseline here. Let's talk about how chronic disease starts fitting into this timeline. Uh, we're going to ditch the old bit. And about 5,000 years ago, we see the creation of near vegetarian diets in India and Egypt, which was as we've discussed, largely driven by hunting animals to extinction. 5,000 years ago, same time, we start using seed crops to produce oils. That is apparently a sesame seed flower, or a sesame flower. 300 years ago, industrial processing of starches. Uh, the roller mills were invented in 1600s in Europe. And then about 150 years ago, industrial production of seed oils uh, with the detoxification of cotton seed in the United States. Um, so the first chronic disease happened quite a while ago, 14,000 years ago. Um, took a little while for the next one to come along. Stunting appears in the anthropological record um, 5,000 years ago, around the, this may be coincidence, around the time of near vegetarian diets becoming a big thing. Um, and then malocclusion started about 300 years ago, along with the, in, you know, it's at the same time of the invention of the roller mill. And that's interesting, because that was a long time after dental caries became a problem, right? And diabetes was a rare disease about two and a half thousand years ago, um, shortly after you know, the development of what you might call modern diets in India. Uh, it was first mentioned in India and, and also in Egypt and then a little later in China, um, about, you know, 2,500 years ago. Diabetes, of course, became a common disease about 120 years ago. Same thing for heart disease, rare two and a half thousand years ago. We have records from mummies um, in Egypt. 120 years ago, it becomes a common disease. Cancer also, 120 years ago, becomes a very common disease. Um, 
and there are others that we're not going to get into today. And unfortunately, because we only have 30 minutes, I had to cut uh, the cancer part out of my presentation. Um, so maybe we'll do that another time. Uh, what I'd like to do is shortly cover chronic diseases with known causation, in my opinion, at any rate. Um, these three, we have clear, well-recognized cause, causation, increased carbohydrate, decreased meat. We have RCTs confirming this causation, mostly in humans. The malocclusion is an animal model, because uh, you can't do that to kids, obviously. Um, stunting and cavities are partially reversible through diet. And we, yes, we do have RCTs in human children coming out of Africa that show that stunted kids will rapidly regain lost ground in growth. Milk is OK, but meat is best. Um, and these are, to my knowledge, the only common diseases where causation by carbohydrate and malnutrition has been shown. Uh, this is a quote from a paper by a dentist and an anthropologist. Um, Malocclusion was one of the defining traits of the introduction of the roller mill in white flour. So now let's get into things with disputed causation. This is a little more interesting. Um, ancient heart disease and diabetes uh, started several thousand years after seed oils became a part of the human diet. Um, they ramped up a couple decades after seed oil industrial production became a thing. Um, let's discuss quickly the old evidence, um, just because we can dispose of it rather quickly. It's largely circumstantial. You know, it's just we don't have great records. Uh, type 2 diabetes is mostly written records. Um, you know, we have good evidence of cardiovascular disease. But it's impossible, really, to know prevalence because there just are no records back then. Uh, most of this is an extrapolation back from modern hunter-gatherer agricultural societies. So let's focus on the modern evidence, and we can extrapolate back. Um, so we are just going to focus on the modern diseases. They are highly correlated with, with each other, both in their prevalence in populations and also in longitudinally in time, as we just saw. This suggests that there's a common mechanism. Uh, all are new diseases at current prevalence. I mean, within living memory, and we'll go through that, there were industrial populations with low rates of cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes. And every population that has transitioned to a modern American-style diet has high rates of chronic diseases, which suggests that it's something in the modern American style diet that has caused this. Um, I remember some fellow saying to me once, well, what about pollution? And I said, OK, the fattest people on Earth live on an island in the South Pacific Ocean. What pollution are they getting, right? Um, this is a quote from Good Calories, Bad Calories. Between 1900 and 1920, the death rate from diabetes, despite improved treatment of the disease, obviously via a low-carb diet, had increased by as much as 400 percent. It had increased 15-fold since the end of the Civil War. So even in the United States, these are new diseases. And you'll notice there's a perfect correlation with the introduction of seed oils into our diet there. So let's discuss a little bit about seed oils. What are they? They are oils that are produced from seeds, not fruit. Seeds, cotton seeds, sunflower, sesame seeds. Um, you all know the list as opposed to fruits like olive, avocado, palm, or coconut. Coconut sort of sits on the fence, but we're going to throw it in the fruit pile here just to make the argument cleaner. Um, <laughs> seeds generally have high polyunsaturated fat content, especially omega-6 fats. Um, macadamia is the exception. Uh, fruits tend to have monounsaturated or saturated fats, much less omega-6. Sesame soy seed oil, as I first said, uh, was cultivated about 5,000 years ago in India, extracted by crushing, uh, spread into Egypt, the Mediterranean, and Africa through trade. Safflower was also cultivated in Egypt. Uh, the use was common in the Ptolemaic period. That's the period of Greek rule in Egypt. Um, but references begin to it about 3,500 years ago during the period of 
King Tut, and I was really looking for a reason to use a King Tut image in this presentation. And I actually, it's like legit, <laughs> not just gratuitous. It was used as food and for lamps. Um, interestingly enough, animal fat was illegal in Ptolemaic Egypt. Um, we don't know why, but there was a book that was rules about, among other things, fat usage, and it said that animal fat was illegal to sell, to use, no idea why. But an interesting factoid. Um, modern mass production of seed oil started in the 19th century, 200 years ago. By the early 19th century, Russian farmers were growing 2 million acres of sunflower. That's a lot of sunflower oil. American production started with cottonseed, which was originally in toxic industrial food waste uh, product. Quote, generally the manufacturers of the United States make no pretense of exporting pure lard. The chief adulterant found is cottonseed oil. This was from a investigation by the Canadian government into the problems with the American lard supply, which is where they got most of their lard. And you'll note the date on that, 1890. Uh, seed oils in America started way before Crisco was an issue. Um, and then Crisco came along in 1911 and took vegetable fats mainstream. Cottonseed ruled until soybean oil was introduced. Um, here we have a couple of little graphs showing seed oil consumptions. You can see soybean oil taking off there. Um, that's from a great paper that uh, Chris also mentioned, Blasball from 2011. Uh, this is also from that linoleic acid, which is the primary omega-6 fat in seed oils, and its increase across the 20th century. It's important to note that there wasn't really any data before the early 1900s, so most of what we have back then are narrative um, accounts like, you know, the Canadian investigation. Uh, this is from a neat paper from 1997, uh, the nutrition transition, new trends in the global diet. The single biggest new trend that they saw in the modern nutrition transition was the inclusion of vegetable oil, soybean oil, 70% of edible oils and fats in the United States. Um, unlike other nutrition transitions, fat consumption always went up. In this one, fat consumption went up in poor countries too because they could afford these cheap seed oils. And meat consumption went down, uh, fat intake stayed the same as animal fats were replaced by, by seed oils mostly. This is a quote from Bill Lands, who was one of the leading lipid scientists over the last, the second half of the second century. 50 years later, I cannot cite a definite mechanism or mediator by which saturated fat is shown to kill people. We still don't have any evidence for that, surprisingly enough. Linoleic acid, the primary omega-6 fat in seed oils. Compared to saturated fats, this is very susceptible to oxidative damage because it is missing a few hydrogen atoms. Um, that stearic acid on the right, if you add hydrogen atoms, four in this case, you turn linoleic acid into stearic acid, and that is basically the idea behind hydrogenation. You're turning, you know, a unstable fat into a stable fat. Of course, this process generally isn't perfect, which is where we get synthetic par partially hydrogenated fats from. So like a lot of this stuff, it came with a good idea originally in mind. Um, linoleic acid is part of the problem. Since it's unstable, it oxidizes into other compounds like 4-hydroxynonanol, HNE, which is an aldehyde, same family as formaldehyde. Um, many of these things are highly toxic. It's a mutagen, meaning it causes DNA damage. It is toxic to cells in evolutionarily appropriate amounts. It's a signaling molecule. Now, Amber earlier was talking about um, reactive oxygen species and uh, how they can trigger the uncoupling proteins in the body. This is the chemical that does that, along with palmitic acid. So there are two things that we know that trigger that process, and this is one of them. Um, and, you know, with the right amount, that's a very useful process. Um, it is involved in every aspect of chronic disease I've looked at. It is a marker and a mediator of oxidative stress. Um, mediator means it is involved in the causative process. 
it induces atherosclerosis, insulin resistance, DNA damage, uh, inflammation, mitochondrial dysfunction, fibrosis, pain. There's something called the capsaicin re uh, receptor. Capsaicin, of course, is the thing that makes uh, hot peppers hot. And we actually have a receptor for that, which is why it works, which is why you feel you know, a burning sensation when you eat capsaicin. And this also triggers that sensation. Of course, it's produced in your body. So, you know, nobody wants hot peppers running through their bloodstream. And these are three reviews on, you know, an overview of the whole process. Uh, the, since I skipped the cancer section, I will just note that the primary mutation in human cancers is the P53 tumor protection gene, um, which when it breaks, leaves your body unable to fight a tumor, essentially. This preferentially mutates that in your body and has been shown to do that in multiple human cancers. All the ones that we've seen that go have been skyrocketing in the last year, in the last few decades. Um, and it is derived exclusively from omega-6 fats, which is why I use it as a marker for these processes. So few subjects in the present survey were found to have any of the conventional signs of coronary disease, that it would be futile to analyze the data with any hope of defining the existence of risk factors for the disease within this population. This is from the uh, Tukacenta uh, paper that Chris discussed the other day. Cardiovascular disease is a modern disease. While it existed in ancient Egypt, quote, heart disease was an uncommon cause of death at the beginning of the 20th century. By mid-century, it had become the commonest cause of death, a period of decades. And when heart attack was unknown, it's important to note, some of us were eating lots of animal fat. That was the case in both the United States and the United Kingdom. Cardiovascular disease is still unknown in populations eating ancestrally, which we'll define as no industrially produced food. You don't need a paleo diet to be pretty healthy. An agricultural diet can do, you know, you can do pretty well on an agricultural diet. Um, in the 1960s, some researchers looked at cardiovascular disease in different countries. They used heart attack determined by autopsy, which is an extremely reliable method of determining cardiovascular disease. When you have a heart attack, it leaves permanent damage in your heart that does not ever heal. So even if you die from a car accident, on autopsy, they can tell that at some point in your life you had a heart attack, right? So the question was, is this genetic or environmental? They used thousands of autopsies, even bringing some hearts back to the United States to confirm the diagnosis in the foreign countries. And what they found confirms the earlier studies. So this, they started off looking at uh, Caucasian Americans, 24% rate of myocardial infarction found at death, which is, of course, different from the death rate, as I just said. These were people who had had a heart attack at some point in their lives. Japanese American, 19%. African American, 13%. This is done in the 50s and the 60s, so it's interesting because the African American rate is much higher now, I think the worst in this country. Uh, then they went to Japan, and they looked at autopsy results in Japan. 3% had myocardial infarction at death. This is really interesting. Uh, the rate in Tokyo was 5.8%. The rate outside Tokyo in the rest of the country was in the 1%. And this is a modern, first world, industrialized society. Then they went to Africa, 0.1%. They looked at 4,500 hearts in Nigeria, and they found a single heart attack. So what could the environmental factor be? So in the 1970s, Brown and Goldstein, uh, before they won the Nobel Prize for discovering the LDL receptor that we've all heard so much of, attempted to induce the first step of atheros atherosclerosis. It failed. What they were trying to do was feed LDL to macrophages to turn them into the foam cells that are the progenitors of atherosclerotic plaques. It did not work. 
they discovered that the LDL must be modified. They used a non-physiological way of modification, and they discovered that the macrophages would hoover up this modified LDL. Steinberg and Whitstam demonstrated the nature of the modification. Fats in the LDL must be oxidized. When they are sufficiently oxidized, foam cells, which are essentially poisoned macrophages, will form. Oxidized LDL is cytotoxic. It is toxic to cells. And the toxins in ox LDL are oxidized omega-6 fats, such as HNE. Human studies show that dietary seed oils lead to LDL oxidation. These are two old studies. There's a whole one of them by uh, the famous Dr. Reven. Um, Steinberg and Whitstam did it first in rabbits and then in humans. Um, several human RCTs. Five minutes, huh? <laughs> okay, thank you, sir. Several human RCTs demonstrate higher CBD events with seed oil feeding. Ramsden has a meta-analysis of that. Um, one RCT reduced omega-6 to an approximately evolutionarily appropriate level, saw a 70% decline in cardiovascular disease events. That's where the Mediterranean diet comes from, by the way, Delorgaril et al., 1994, the Lyon Diet Heart Study. So if you remove oxidized LDL from LDL to derive a corrected LDL, corrected LDL is no longer predictive of heart disease events. This is from uh, Sam Tsimikas. And here's a tweet where he discusses that study. So it basically, LP little a is a type of oxidized LDL. It basically says that it is, LDL is only predictive if it contains oxidized LDL of heart disease events. So it's not a normal disease. It's recent, depends on the environment. Only populations eating excess seed oils get cardiovascular disease at modern levels. And it's important to note there are confounders including omega-3 fats and smoking, of course. That's just looking at the rate of seed oil increase in Asia. Okay, on to the next one. Diabetes and seed oils. We have to get something out of the way. Does anybody know what that is? Thank you. You all know the relevance of that, right, I presume? Okay. Uh, the diet consisted almost entirely of sweet potatoes, carbohydrate providing over 90% of the calories. This is, again, the Tukacenta population. No clinical evidence of diabetes was found in this survey. And since you're wondering, this is uh, the sugar composition of the baked, of the sweet potatoes they were eating. Um, most of, uh, not much sucrose, and if we compare it to other countries, they're eating about half what they're eating, what Chinese children are eating. Chinese children have a higher rate of diabetes and obesity than American children nowadays. So it's a question whether uh, that level of sugar consumption is causative. So lots of populations ate or eat traditional diets without type 2 diabetes. Oh, wait a minute. The Bushmen. The Bushmen were diabetic. Quote, the relative carbohydrate intolerance of our primitive Bushmen subjects is at first glance rather surprising. They're the only population I've come across eating that primitive a diet that fails a glucose tolerance test, including the Inuit, by the way. And here's a confirmation. Um, so they ate lots of mongongo fruit and nuts, uh, about a third of their calories. Mongongo nut season was when that diabetic oral glucose tolerance test was taken. Um, one other test was done that didn't confirm this, that was done, we don't know when, so we don't know if it was inside or outside of Mongongo nut season. Uh, when they stopped eating their hunter-gatherer diet, they no longer tested diabetic. And interestingly enough, Mongongo nuts are high in omega-6 fats, like most other seeds and nuts. So, in 1961, soybean oil was introduced as an IV food supplement, intralipid, which we've heard about already. In 1964, it was noted that this makes you insulin resistant and hyperglycemic. By 2004, this was a standard model for producing insulin resistance in humans. 
And since it has really bad effects on the body when it's used as an intravenous feeding protocol, they have been looking for different options. Um, here we see that using a fat called clinoleic instead of intralipid doesn't produce the same levels of gluconeogenesis. They said it's probably because they're not getting insulin resistant. That is an olive oil infusion, low in omega-6 fats. Of course, eating something is vastly different from injecting something. Thank you, sir. In humans, insulin resistance precedes type 2 diabetes by years. Oxidized LDL is associated with insulin resistant, but precedes it by years. And as we've discussed, seed oils lead to LDL oxidation. Other sources of oxidized LDL, smoking and sepsis, also induce insulin resistance. Unexpectedly, targeting oxidized LDL via antibodies improves insulin sensitivity in a monkey model. Switching from a high to a low omega-6 oil diet lowers insulin resistance, a dose-dependent relationship. Uh, liver fat also improves. This was an NAFLD study. I'm going to drag on. i almost there. And you can see the composition of the diet, pretty high in carbohydrates. And this is the before and after. The orange is the baseline. The green is the after the intervention. Um, they were all told to exercise, which is probably why even the control group improved. Lowering the omega-6, omega-3 ratio also lowers insulin resistance. Uh, here's the ratio that they used. Similar diet composition to the previous study. Um, diet monitored by blood biomarkers, including oxidized linoleic acid metabolites, which are very important in these processes. No control, unfortunately, but unlike the previous diet, which was done in a community setting in India, this was done at Yale. And here's the improvement in plasma insulin during the oral glucose tolerance test before and after. So people on a low omega-6 ancestral diet don't get type 2 diabetes. Carbs don't seem to matter. And by the way, that paper on the sweet potatoes also looked at how much glucose was liberated from the starch constructs, um, if you want to go check that out. Um, Insulin resistance and hyperglycemia are mediated in part by the immune system through LDL, which is why sepsis causes insulin resistance. And reducing omega-6 fat uh, ameliorates those conditions in humans. Nevertheless, I will point out it is type 2 diabetes is a condition of carbohydrate intolerance, so the diet for type 2 diabetes should be a low-carb diet. In 1616, uh, Tokugawa, the founder of the Japanese Edo government, the precursor to the modern government, died. It is said he had been overeating fish fried in sesame seed oil from tempura and other usage of lamp oil. <laughs> Probably a good use for seed oils. So humans can be healthy eating a wide variety of diets. Chronic disease is clearly linked to diet. Most date from the introduction of seed oils, except for the ones we already discussed. Um, epidemiology and mechanistic studies confirm this. The reduction in elimination uh, or elimination of seed oils and animals concentrating seed crops uh, should be the first step in fixing your diet. Thank you all. So we have uh, about five minutes for questions. Line up at the microphones. Far away. So, all right, Tuck. So I'm pretty sure you're going to agree with everything I'm about to say, but I just wanted to throw it in because I didn't want it to get brushed by very quickly. What you were describing with Brown and Goldstein is that non-modified LDL particles to macrophages, the immune cells, right. are taken up to the appropriate level that they would take up and not much more than that. So they do not take them up to the extent to will that they will then die and turn into foam cells. Correct. However, modified LDL particles at a threshold point can be taken up to the point where eventually the, micro the macrophage gets overwhelmed and can get turned into a foam cell. But even then, there is a threshold point. That's correct. Right. And Another, it's, yes, keep going. No, and that's, and, and that's, I think, an important distinction because I think 
it, it could have been taken, one of your slides could have been taken as just one modified LDL particle starts this cascade that's now going to be in a positive feedback loop and there's no yes. back from it. And it's important to note that all of these processes are normal processes. Ox LDL is generated in your body as part of the immune process, right? So it's not, you know, just like you can't get rid of omega-6 fat in a whole food diet, you don't need to. The idea is to keep it within an evolutionarily appropriate level. And, and I think that this is a place where, frankly, Tuck, I think you get misquoted a lot. I think a lot of people believe that you're just anti-PUFA across the board, when in fact right. you acknowledge very frequently, and this includes even in the OxLDL context. Right. I mean, you, even it's interesting, even that Simone have pretty high OxLDL, but they also have a very high infectious load, right? What we see in Americans and people eating a modern diet is what they call sterile inflammation, um, where you have an inflammatory response with no trigger, right? And that seems to be pretty clearly, and mechanistically, it's been demonstrated to be caused by excess oxidized omega-6 fats in the body. Specifically, I mean, OxLDL. OxLDL causes inflammation, right? Yes. Well, as it should, particularly at a certain right. threshold point. Exactly. Thanks. That's right. And Dave, by the way, is the guy who pointed out the research that led to that Samikas tweet quote. So thank you for that, sir. Go ahead. Um, I was just wondering if you'd be able to comment if I know cancer isn't part of your presentation, but if you subscribe to uh, the idea that cancer is a disease of mitochondria, how uh, the linoleic acids contribute to that? Just one or two cents. Oh, like, yeah. It's, uh, I interviewed Thomas Seafried a little while ago, actually, and we discussed this, and there's a clear relationship. As he pointed out, um, oxidized cardiolipin, which is a molecule that's crucial to mitochondrial function, is found in every single cancer he ever looked at. And it's important to note that the definition of oxidized cardiolipin is that it has oxidized linoleic acid in it. So that's where the HNE comes from that goes on to cause the DNA mutations both in the mitochondria and in the nucleus of the cell. So yeah, there is a clear, very tight linkage and I wish I could have, you know, if we had another 15 minutes here, I could have gone through that too. Thank you. <laughs> yep, um, fire away. Thanks, that was, that was really good. I was really worried you were gonna get through the whole talk without saying Oxlands, but you did get there in the, you did get there in the end. That and the Tutankhamun picture were like <laughs> major goals. So I'm gonna ask you a question about a paper that I'm sure you've read, but maybe not everybody else has. And considering the senior author, it was surprising to me that it wasn't just immediately th throw outable as garbage, um, but it's a meta-analysis in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition in 2020 by Lee et al which did a, a meta-regression and meta-analysis of two different sets of linoleic acid data. So one was intake levels from population prospective studies from 1% to 12% on average. And the other one was looking at tissue levels of linoleic acid. They used blood, they used adipose tissue, they used various other different markers. And they basically didn't see any association of or dose response of linoleic acid increasing with cardiovascular deaths, all-cause mortality, or cancer deaths. Um, and I'm not, and they actually, if anything, they saw the opposite. And so this isn't me saying you should all go out and drink seed oil, but there wasn't even a signal of harm in that study. So I'm just wondering if your thoughts about that paper. I haven't looked at that particular paper. It's the short answer. I have looked at similar papers um, that do find relationships, you know, looking at intake and also at uh, serum levels. I find it, I don't know where they got the data from, obviously, but I find it incredible that they found anybody in a modern context who has had 1% of linoleic acid in their diet. Um, I mean, Ramsden and colleagues just did a targeted reduction of linoleic acid with the NIH, and they weren't able to get down to anywhere close to that level, right? So the notion that you can, because of the prevalence of linoleic acid, so I have real problems with the data behind that. Yeah, that's Just the that's prima the facie. Yeah, I mean, nutritional epidemiology you can usually throw out, but right. with the uh, with the you know tissue levels. I th just thought it's interesting, and they didn't I, do any fancy statistical adjustments, right? It's a univariate meta regression. Well, so not adjust 
other than so you're not adjusting for downstream like obesity or types of diabetes which are going to be the actual right. thing that's causing right. That, right yeah 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 which would be invalid adjustments yeah, exactly. right um there are i mean what's interesting in a lot of these processes and ARD specifically there's a paper looking at linoleic acid in the bloodstream and what they saw was that as the disease progressed the linoleic acid levels went down because they were being converted into HNE, which is the toxin, right? Linoleic acid on its own is harmless, right? So in a lot of cases, what seems to be happening is that high linoleic acid indicates that you don't have the inflammatory processes going on, right? And as the diseases progress, and they've seen this in type 2 diabetes, there's a Australian paper where intake of linoleic acid scaled like this um, against type 2 diabetes, but then when they looked at people who had it, their serum level was going down, indicating that as, as the disease process progresses, it's breaking down in the body. And you see that in traumatic brain injury, you see that in stroke, you see that in a number of other diseases that involve these oxlams in the, seem to involve these oxlams in disease progression. Does that answer your question? But I just think it's uh, an interesting ongoing Thing that we have to keep looking at. Yeah, well, I'll. Somebody mentioned that. I'll send you that paper. Yeah, thank you, sir. Eating into the break, but I know that she's been waiting very patiently. To ask if it's a quick question, I'll let you come um, answer. Well, just if you could go into, we talked about this earlier. Obviously, you're talking about you know type two diabetes. We know is a situation of carbon tolerance. If you can talk about what we know about some of the molecular pathways, how you get from linoleic acid to this insulin resistance, just how that operates. And about the same oh, level. Yeah, well, that's actually quite clearly demonstrated. Um, Peter Atia did an interview with a guy, Ger uh, Gerald or Gerard Shulman, a uh, masterclass on insulin resistance. I'd never heard of this guy before listening to the podcast. Um, first thing he said was, well, we use intralipid to induce insulin resistance in people. And when you start drilling down in his uh, mechanism, it is triglycerides are broken down into diacylglycerides, which basically one of the fats is removed from the glycerol backbone. And, you know, the requirement seems to be either oxidized linoleic acid or linoleic acid and palmitic acid in those triglycerides drive the process. They upregulate uh, protein kinase C epsilon, which causes insulin resistance in the cells. So they have a very, you know, I mean, He's been working on this model for a long time. He didn't take it quite to the extent that I did, but he did some more research when people re came back to him and said, well, wait a minute, these diacylglycerides don't always cause insulin resistance. Why not? And it turns out that there's a requirement for the fats that it's composed of, which is why intralipid works so great. It's, you know, mostly omega-6 fats. Thank you so much, Tucker. Let's uh, thank him again. Thank you all. We have a six-minute break until Dr. Tommy Woods is up, so don't go far. <laughs>